Okay, today we're looking at the market revolution and changes that happened with uh, early, early industrialization and what was going on um, at that point. I want to just kind of look at um, the north and the south as far as what um, was happening with them as well as, was, I guess we put both in the middle here, um, because this really is the start to of um, this shift of, of certainly the dichotomy between the North and South as they further separate from each other. And we're going to see some of these things that are developing here are going to play out in tensions when we get to the Civil War. So for both, you have a population increase and westward expansion. Now what they do with this, of course, is is different in the process with a population increase in the north you end up getting urban centers and cities that become a much larger uh in the process and um this is going to lead to more people moving into urban centers and city centers that are going to be working um let's say the farming decline and rise in uh, industry, right? So that's how things go with the north because of the population increase um, and the westward expansion. Um, and, and certainly they take advantage of new technology. We can put new technology in both because they, the south will too, just differently. Okay, uh, the South uh, is going to go a different way that they're going to focus instead of on industry and urban centers is continued agrarian growth, right? Farming, specifically with new technology where you have Eli's cotton gin. And this new technology is going to allow for an increase in cotton plantations. in the west southwest which is going to lead to a re-emergence of a slave based society all right whereas the rise in industry is going to focus on wage labor um so these are kind of things that are happening, and, and as I said, it's going to create this, this argument dichotomy between the two of, of further separating and, and, and having similarities, um, whereas the South moves more and more towards um, uh, a slave-based society and really relying on slavery. In fact, the South had, they, it had been thought that uh, slavery was uh, naturally going to um, deny, uh, was going to die out. Um, because uh, they had in the deep south overused some of the land with tobacco. Tobacco wasn't a big cash crop anymore. Cotton was there, but it was pretty fragile. Um, and what happens at the same time that there is um, the cotton gin is that you have a new strain of cotton that was hardier. Uh, it essentially was hardier and could survive in the West. And then because of the cotton gen, it could be cleaned. So what happened is, okay, so you had this more delicate South um, cotton in the South that could be grown in some areas, but it was pretty intensive labor. You before the cotton gen, you know, the, the taking it out, the separating the seeds, the cleaning it, all of that was a very tedious and slow process. Um, the cotton gin ends up bypassing the individual for having to do that. And while it still has to be picked you know, and sorted and put through the gin, the cotton gin cleans it. And the cotton gin with the new strand of cotton that was hardier and could survive in areas where they had expanded west. Um, and, and, and with a hardier, even though it had been really too coarse to use before, the cotton gin could break that down. And because of that, then you have a whole new cotton base that thrived in the new land. And this created a mass Western expansion movement 
Um, and that, of course, and then and then those places became slave based societies in the Southwest. And that's going to create a whole conflict um, between with the westward expansion between the north and the south, because, of course, as the north is expanding west, they are, too. Um, they don't are not using slaves and they're not going to when this, the uh, states become more than when they become states. They're going to apply for as a free state, whereas in the southwest areas, when they become states, they're going to apply as a slave state. And and this culminates in um, the Kansas-Nebraska Act and bleeding Kansas and, 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 and culminates in violence even before the Civil War over the issues of which states would come in as what. Um, and so this is the start of that, right? We're, we're still a ways off. But it's the start of it that, that kind of creates the domino effect that has it. So this is important in that sense. And then another thing that certainly is for both is the idea of manifest destiny. Um, they're going to use it differently uh, on, on how they just, you know, the north versus the south. But both have this idea that um, the, this was, you know, ordained by God that they had a natural right uh, to expand. In fact, it was their destiny to expand uh, and, and you know, develop and take, which, of course, is going to create um, issues with Native Americans. So there's a lot going on during this period um, that's taking place. And so I wanted to start there. Uh, I guess I can put one here just because... All of this is kind of culminating in, and then what we're gonna we're gonna then you know zoom in and look at one part, which is the North and the Market Revolution that was taking place, and then we're gonna go look at the West Stuart expansion and some of that, and then we're gonna look at um, um, the South, obviously when we get to pre Civil War um, tensions and aspects. So each of these things we're gonna kind of zoom in and look at more. For right now, then we're looking at um, the Market Revolution and uh, what developed with that. So one of the things I just want to mention is new technology and how that opens up the way for um, factories and, and whatnot. So you had um, inland roads that had always been there. Cause one of the things we're going to look at is um, transportation of goods. And as well as um, powering the factory. These are the two, two main things that technology needs to change that um, is going to make it easier for factories in the process. So one of the first is, of course, just inland roads. Um, and depending on how well they're paved or created, um, this can be helpful, but the, the reality is, is that the majority of the roads were made wagon uh, travel difficult. You either had summer dust storms or mud. Um, and so there were attempts to make the roads better. The um, Probably the most known one was the federal government created the National Road. in 1808 um, and this uh, helped as far as it was built with on gravel and a stone foundation and allowed them to cross the Appalachian Mountains in Maryland which opened up the West opened the West uh, and then again, also just traveling with goods. Now, of course, the problems with inland roads is that they are slow and limiting on what you can can um, pack, travel with, right? What you can ship. There we go. Right? What goods you're shipping in the process. So, of course... Uh, the other way that things were used is by ships. Specifically, um, you had seaports um, that transported seaports that transported goods from uh, coastal towns and ports.
So traditional older ships, right? That was one way. But another way was the newer invention of the steamboat. And the steamboat could travel um, in small areas with rivers, which this is going to open up uh, larger, uh, more access to factories. So that's a big one. And then um, we'll do ships, let's go ships or water. Because then the, the third one is the creation of canals. Specifically, the most known one is Lake Erie. Um, and, and this was, it was, it, it, uh, it was a huge route between the Hudson River and Lake Erie. It cost this canal $7 million, um, which was expensive <laughs> at that time. And then the idea was, is how a canal worked with this is you had, if you had the canal, you had a big flat area where you could put your goods and then there would be horses my, that would have be harnessed on um, that uh, that would walk along the banks right and pull your goods back and forth and you would pay tolls and other things for those goods the idea with what the was important with this was that the the belief was it would open up new areas to factories that needed to ship their goods because the the hope was is that people would settle near the um canal um the problem was it did it did i mean it it did use it but it took till eighteen um twenty five um, it's a lady, but it's the Erie Canal here. 1825, it took a long time to build, and by that point, um, you had a lot of people who yeah, initially had moved west along the canal path, um, but, um, you know, they're going to be moving further because of railroads. So the canal, the canal worked, because it did, what it did is people moved west, they had towns near the canal, so it did have... An important financial component, um, but people continued moving west because the other thing that emerged was railroads. And railroads, uh, between 1800s and 1830s, they were available, but they were secondary um, to other things like ships, canals, uh, and whatnot. New technology with invention of the better tracks. So let's see, better tracks. Um, steam powered locomotives. Steam engines, just like with the boats, right? Um, and they actually created specifically passenger car trains that they didn't really have before. So it was both for shipping goods and transporting people. This, uh, and then they started actively uh, laying tracks. So by 1840, main mode of transportation of people and goods. Okay, so this is the new technology that was taking place that showed up during this time and um, it plays a role in two parts so three factory um develop well, let's do development of the factory here um because what is going to happen what's it what's going to happen is it's going to open up more opportunities for the factory The majority of people were still farmers, right? People farmed, they, this was self-sustaining and they could make a little money on the extra, uh, the outside. However, with the increased population and 
population and new technology, individual farmers were struggling. So we'll say started to struggle because really it's after the Civil War that people that the average American is no longer a farmer. The average American is still a farmer. This is what people did still at this point in time. But you're starting to see some difficulty with certain farmers um, being able to um, sustain as well as they would like. Okay, so the second thing you had around this time were then artisans. Artisans were the ones that, that, that created goods. Um, they usually worked, they could sometimes be merchants too, but they usually worked with the merchants and um, they made goods, quality goods such as shoes, tables, etc. other furniture, things like that, that artisans usually you had to study and learn your craft, right? They made the whole product, which is important. And they had almost always had apprenticeship to learn skills. And this had been the traditional thing is you had farmers and artisans and this is, and the artisans, we'll put it here, sold goods to merchants, right? Well, one of the things that happens with new technology is that they, um, it, well, it improves. And so an example is going to be um, the, what becomes kind of, it's known as the putting out system. And, and this is uh, mostly done by women and children to supplement farming income. What it uh, would do is that um, <clears throat> you would have uh, not an artisan anymore, but uh, a building that would produce parts of um, the shoe. Here, so let's do so making a shoe. Um, and so the how it works, parts made in factory building with tools too big for individual home. Then um, the, let's see, the woman would come pick up the pieces and take it home and make the shoes by assembling pieces, right? <clears throat> and then they returned final product. The benefit of doing this is twofold. So family makes some money you know, through piecework essentially, and prices are cheaper because it costs less to make. Oh, my dog is going crazy here. Okay, so you return, the family makes more money, the prices are cheaper. Quality's not as good, but for most people, they didn't care. Which this is ultimately, uh, as the factory develops more and more, going to hurt the artisan. Um, but it it produces more goods available to the average person. So this is just the the, the start of that. Another example was the spinning um, for thread uh, shoe. Yeah, three here spinning. You had uh, early on. 
the spinning wheel. was um it was small enough was was small enough for the home the home and uh with new technology uh it they they created a spinning wheel that could get that was faster and faster but it, it grew larger till it became steam powered so increased in size and expense the average person couldn't have one in their home anymore. And then eventually that shifted to steam powered uh, wheel, uh, spinning looms, spinning machines. Uh, an example would be what was called the cotton spinning Jenny. And and these were like the concentration. These were uh, then you'd have a, a wealthier business owner uh, put multiple machines in a building, and then the idea, of course, was people would come. To the building to to work. So instead of working from your home, instead from home, you know, work outside of home. And that's the idea behind that. And we'll see how it works with the little mills. One of the other things that changes, um, I'll put D here, of course, was location of factories. So that's how it begins to shift to factories, right? Once they create factories, the location is incredibly important. It initially had to be by a water source, specifically um, a port, right, for shipping goods. Then with new technology and steam powered, water based, actually it's water based first, you had water powered factories. Right, so the technology required, which also required water. This was limiting and, and uh, you know, where factories could be placed and then how many developed because of availability. We'll say this limited availability and locations. However, you have the development of steam powered uh, technology and railroads. And, and the canals, but especially these two, which meant that factories could be a lot further away from populations and cities. In fact, what they're really, what is eventually going to establish are what is called factory towns that you're going to have towns develop around the factory that's built kind of in the middle of nowhere. And where we best see that is for here, Lowell Mills. Lowell Mills is going to be one of the earliest factory um, structures and um, it's kind of going to show the transition in system from what they initially tried to do to what it becomes with industrialization. Um, so well, the low mills, um, the goal was, well, there were several things. First, he got, you had new te technology that brought into place. Supposedly this is a early uh, corporate espionage as the owner 
stole plans from from England. The low mills were textile factories. And he created it and then what he had had uh, did for um, workers is that he went and asked um, the sons and farmers to work for him. And they rejected him. So why? There's a couple reasons. The first was um, farming still provided and made money. Now, it didn't mean they weren't struggling some, but not enough to quit farming yet. Okay, so some struggle, but not enough to quit. The other thing, of course, is that if you, the ideal was, and you can see this in our American con uh, like uh, psyche today, there's still this like ideal of buying land, owning land, even if you're not farming anymore, right? The farmer, the ideal of becoming a farmer and owning land is now becoming a homeowner and owning a home. But there's still this like almost innate desire for when you say, well, what do you want to do when you grow up? You know, what do you hope to achieve? And most people still think, you know, that, that owning that home, owning that, that property is not only part of being growing up, but is important. And that's something, you, you know, you should and you're supposed to do. Well, that was kind of how it was for farming. People wanted to be farmers. This is what you were supposed to do. This is what you want to do. The other reason is a textile factory, right? That's spinning and sewing, which was seen as women's work. The other thing was factories had a negative reputation from England. And we want to look at that one um, here. We'll just pull we'll it here. So one of the England was the first to industrialize. And they made all the mistakes for everyone else that people learned not to do. And you had industrialization, had factories that had the mines and things like that. We, um, Elizabeth Barrett Browning wrote a poem, The Cry of the Children. And what you have... Let me just make this. Right, um, so England, the factories, they were, they treated people poorly. They uh, actually brought in orphan, they would buy orphan children, essentially, owners would, and then have them live in the factories and work there for free until they were 18 to 21, um, almost as indentured servants in the process. So this poem is kind of about, um, you know, creating industry and, and the future on the backbone of children. And so it says, do you hear the children weeping on my brothers? Ere the sorrow comes with years, they are learning, they are leaning their he young heads against their mothers and that cannot stop their tears. The young lambs are bleeding in the meadows. The young birds are chirping in the nest. The young fawns are playing with the shadows. The young flowers are blowing towards the west. But the young, young children, oh my brothers, they are weeping bitterly. They are weeping in the playtime of others in the country of the free. Do you question the young children in the sorrow? So the first part, if we're looking at it, um, do you hear the children weeping? Um, right, and they, they basically the, the children are crying where all these other young, right? So do you hear the children weeping in their sorrow and they can't stop their tears? And then she combines that with, the young, everything else that's young, are yeah. You know, the other young are fine. Young are okay, but but the children, right? But the young, young children are weeping bitterly. But the children are not okay.
right? So that it's meant to compare that. Then do you, you know, she's saying, do you question why they're, they're, they're crying? Why are they upset? The old man makes sense for why they'd weep the old, the old, right? So it's saying the old should be sad um, or, or whatever, but the young, why are they weeping sore before the bosoms of their mothers in our happy fatherland? So this is contrasting, you know, happy country because of industry with uh, sad children. And then it says, they look up with their pale and sunken faces and their looks are sad to see. For the man's grief abhorrent draws and presses down the cheeks of infancy. infancy. Your old earth, they say, is very dreary. Our young feet, they say, are very weak. Few paces have we taken, yet are weary. Our grave rest is very far to seek. Ask the old why they weep and not the children, for the outside earth is cold, and we young ones stand without and are bewildering, and the graves are for the old. Um, so again, it's just more of this conditions, right? Pale and sunken faces, their looks are sad to see. Um, earth is dreary, we are weak, and almost lamenting that they aren't going to die for a while. True, said the children, it may happen that we die before our time. Little Alice died last year. Her grave is shapen like a snowball in the rhyme. We looked into the pit, prepared to take her. Was no room for any work in the closed clay. From the sleep wherein she layeth, none will wake her, crying, Get up, little Alice, it is day. If you listen by that grave and sun and shower, with your ear down, little Alice never cries. Could we see her face? Be sure we should not know her, for the smile has time for a growing in her eyes. And Mary go her moments lulled and stilled in the shroud they kick uh, by the Kirk chime. So, and then they says that good that uh, it's good when it happens to the children that we die before our time. So, happy to die young. And this story is that basically they wouldn't recognize Alice because in death. She gets rest and reprieve, so she would be smiling. So that's I mean, definitely a crazy idea, of, right? That basically, the only way we're going to have happiness is when we die. Because life otherwise is not good. And then, you know, they're seeking death and life is best to have. Um, and then it says, why not go out children from the mine and from the city, sing out children as little thrushes do, pluck your handfuls of the meadow cowslips pretty, laugh aloud to fill your fingers, let them through. So this is saying, why not kids get out of the city, right? And have fun. Hmm? And they say, um, Leave us in, quiet in the dark of the cold shadow from your pleasures fair and fine. And this one kind of continues into the next stanza. For oh, say the children, we are weary and we cannot run or leap. If we cared for any meadows, it were merely to drop them down in them and sleep. Our knees tremble sorely in the stooping. We fall upon our faces trying to go. And underneath our heavy eyelids drooping, the reddest flower would look as pale as snow. For all day we drag our burden tiring through the cool dark underground, or all day we drive the wheels of iron in the factories round and round. So they're saying we are too tired to go to the country and play. They need sleep and everything looks pale anyway because of, of the exhaustion and tiredness, right? For all day the wheels are droning and turning, their wind comes in our faces till our hearts turn and our, our heads with new pulses burning. Um, this just all day working, all day working. Um, and then I say, okay, well tell the poor children, young children, oh my brothers, to look up to him and pray. 
So the blessed one who blesses all others will bless them another day. The answer, who is God that he should hear us while the rushing of the iron wheel stirred? When we sob aloud, the human creatures near us pass by hearing not nor answer not a word. And we hear not for the wheels and their resounding strangers speaking at the door. Is it likely God with angels singing around him hears our weeping anymore? So that they say that God can't hear us. And, and this says, you know, there's the prayer, our father looking up in that chamber. We say softly for a charm. We know other words except our father. And we think that in some pause of angel song, God may pluck them with the silence sweet together and hold both within his right hand, which is strong. Um, again, this is a person, this is an adult talking. It goes back and forth. It starts off with the kids and then goes to the adult and says, you know, God and the Father's Prayer. And they say, like, this can help you, right? And they say, no, um, <clears throat> he is speechless as stone. And they tell us his image is the master who commands us to work on. Go to see the children up to heaven. Dark will turning clouds are all will find. Do not mock us. Grief has made us unbelieving. We look up for God, but tears have made us blind. Do you hear the children weeping and disproving? So they're saying that the only image with our father and master is the factory owner who forces them to work. Right? And then and then they also say that God the, this grief and hard work makes us unbelieving. Don't believe in God. So it's not going to be helpful anyway. <clears throat> and the author then looks up the end um <clears throat> this this last one is about saying how long will we ignore the pain and suffering of the children um Will you stand to move the world on a child's heart, right? Um, for industrialization and progress. So that's the, the poem. And it certainly paints a bleak picture of um, the workers um, and the structure in England and whatnot. So... With that in mind, right, Lowell had to create what was the Lowell ideal. Um, and well, actually, before we get to the Lowell ideal, right, so he asked the farmers, they rejected it. There's already this negative connotation of the factory. So he shifts his focus to the young unmarried women. Of the farmers. But of course, this was this was problematic because we just said you had this whole concept of what the factory was like and the problems with that. So it created the Lowell ideal, and the Lowell ideal, which was meant to convince uh, parents of these girls that they could, cause they were going to have to live in the factory town. All right, they, the factory's too far away. They weren't going to be able to travel from day back and forth, back and forth. So that it was that, one, um, it could be clean and uh, safe, the factory, right? It was the opposite of that, that dreary, dark, damaging place. It would protect women's virtue and still make a profit. Right, it's clean and safe and happy, right? Protect women's virtue, still make a profit. So this was the Lowell ideal. Um, and it was very firmly rooted in paternalism. That women needed protection and needed their virtue protected. And that role traditionally went to the father, right? The father looked after, after daughter. And then when she got married, it went to the husband. 
but this was going to be interrupted, right? Because living in the factory homes, right? No male relative. So who was going to protect? Who protects the factory owner? The factory owner becomes the one responsible for protecting and providing this. And that's the lull ideal. So that's, and it's important because it's how it sets up um, the factory system. So let's put here factory structure. Um, and so they do convince the, you know, why did the girls, why, um, why did the girls go? Well, one, they could use the extra cash. And once it started, many women did hear of the opportunities it could provide them because it was the first experience being away from home. And while the factory owner was stepping in to take that place with a male role, it wasn't the same as, as being with your father or your husband. So the factory structure, um, let's go. They worked you know, 12 to 14 hours a day, later it goes up to 16. And um, six days a week. For work. Um, so, I mean, it was, you got Sundays off in that process. Um, they had dorms with um, four to six women per room. Meals were provided, but they actually had the women uh, take turns helping with cooking and cleaning. And the reason for this was, of course, the idea that they, you know, their their role was going to still be, uh, right? What's your uh, role? Motherhood and white, you know, motherhood, oh, don't do that. Motherhood and being a wife, right, is end goal. So they're making sure that they have a proper feminine uh, skills. Right, they don't want to oh, get away with that, if you will. Right, that this is important that um, that we uh, keep those skills available. Um, they made usually one fifty to two dollars a week initially. which, you know, doesn't seem a lot now, but it was a, you know, decent amount for them because they didn't have to spend um, that money at this point. Now, this factory structure is going to get corrupt, but at this point, they do. you have the Lull Bank that was created for savings. There were uh, classes the women could attend. There was a library. There were uh, quite a bit of rules of conduct for the women that did include curfew, courting, dating, right, rules. It wasn't called dating, but courting, but same idea with that. Um, dress code and behavior requirements. I mean, there was still a lot, and this, this was all seen as 
protecting the virtue of women. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, these, these were the big things. Work, classes, dorms, meals were provided. Um, they lived there, right? But they didn't have to pay for that. There was a, a hospital for them if they got sick. 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 Anyway, this, so this was the structure. And it did, it did work for a while. Um... This, this, this did work. Um, the factories were largely clean if you look at the early description. So early, say early Lowell factory. It was clean and safe initially. They had lots of greenery, green plants. Um, around to that. Oh, one of the other things, 11, they had what was called the Lowell Offering, which was a, a magazine that was produced by the girls that worked in the Lowell Mills. There was, I think, seven to ten Lowell Mills that get created. So the early Lowell Mills with the girls working, and remember, these are young middle class girls. They're not stuck here, and this is going to be key. It was clean and safe, so lots of green plants, which was meant to be the opposite of England, right? It was largely middle class and uh, lower middle class. I'm going to put that because it is important. It wasn't the wealthy here. Lower, middle, and there wasn't really a class. You had the middling group um, girls that were unmarried. So age range went from, you know, right, usually around 14 to 28 years. 28 would have been old. And the plan was that they would get married when they quit the job. or they would quit the job when they got married. But either way, um, you know, they could leave and had family to fall back on, which will be important when conditions start to change. <clears throat> the girls didn't have to pay for food, so you have food and room provided for them. That talks about in several of the writings that the work was long, but it was slow paced and lots of free time during the work day. In earliest times, they could even bring things to do in between, because basically what they do is they change the spindle. And there's these big spindles that like once all the thread was off of it, they had to put a new one in. But there was, this was usually like an hour between each one. And so they could read books, they could talk, they were stuck, they could go out and sit on, out in the uh, grass in the sun. So it was meant to not be over strenuous, even though they were working long hours. Um, that it was initially a slow pace. There was room board for them. The, what was really beneficial for the women was that this provided a sense of community of girls and friendships that they would not have had the opportunity to do before not available before and they also an independence not available before Right, making money, being able to spend it, being able to help the family. These were all beneficial changes. Um, what we're going to see, though, is that the, the later Lowell Mills are going to change and we'll call it in factory towns. Okay, so it starts off, it does start off beneficial. The problem, of course, being that cotton prices 
went down. And so the low mills, you know, ultimately focused on profit, right? This became more important than the low ideal. So it's more important. All right, and this also changed because so what they did is they increased the hours and more uh, work, so no more breaks anymore. So no breaks, and in fact, they often were in charge of so many spindles that it was just nonstop pace. Um, and uh, no, we'll say nonstop pace. It was too much. It became too much because they were expected, to, as I said, to do that all of a sudden you'd have five or six spindles and it was just constantly running around. Um, the, um, those in charge, the managers became less friendly. They had wages cut and they also started creating, creating costs for room and board. Now, what the women did um, with this, so the women actually unionized essentially and went on strike, demanding better conditions. This worked for a little bit, but Ultimately, there was two things that happened with this. One, many women, when it became tedious and difficult, went back home to either family or marriage when it was too difficult. And immigrant families, and population were increasing. And so more and more factory owners looked to replace the women and get this here. with immigrants, immigrant families, because they could be paid less and harsher conditions. This is important because that's certainly a huge part of it. Um, and then this is going to create factory towns. They were already kind of there at the low mills but the factory towns were a more predatory style um, that was based around um, immigrant workers and their families. And it had lots of the components of low mills. Right, factories. The difference being is that everything had a price. And again, remember in a lot of the factories, you were kind of out in the middle of ever, anywhere, uh, nowhere. And so you couldn't just go jot off to the town to get your food from a different store. So rent for room, they had a grocery store where they would take um, basically a tabs, um, and, and because when well, the reality was that a lot of the families couldn't pay their bill in full. And so they'd take a tab and it would create, of course, a running debt. They had, they still had schools for the children. 
and library. But that 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 this uh, the library often even costs money the the um, card and whatnot. Um, I mean, those are the big things is that you have rent here, the grocery store, tab for running debt. Uh, but these prices, you know, were prices were set to take advantage of people. Because they had nowhere else to go. Um, so, and the, you usually had families that worked. So you had um, that anyone that you, it was the, in the factory. It wasn't just the husband. You now had, um, see the whole women's virtue didn't matter when it was immigrants at that point. The husband, the wife, and kids over, you know, depended eight to 10 worked in the factories too and and this created you know it was it was a tiring labor intensive system that it shifted to long hours conditions Let's put that on. right so it's long hours hard and dangerous work Many people, you know, the women often had to uh, take care of the family and food, clothing, etc. After, before, and after working in the factories. And then you also had that childcare could be an issue. They usually rented out space in their homes because they couldn't afford um, <clears throat> the the whole the whole room the whole home. Okay, so like so the conditions were horrible. They had to rent out space in their homes because they couldn't afford the whole home. They uh women had to do quite a lot of work. Often young babies and toddlers were watched by the young kids not working in the factory. which obviously could lead to disaster and problems uh, because, you know, having a six-year-old watch a baby isn't a good idea. Not enough money for food and clothing. And the debt system kept them in a perpetual... state of servitude because they can never pay to get out of the owner's system. So it could not pay to get out of owner's debt. Okay, and then and then ultimately, what this is going to create is this just creates a very system of um, for with this group, the poor working class. Um, but it is also going to create the middle class because these are going to be the managers, bankers, lawyers. Right, these are largely going to be the immigrant families that start off as immigrant families and then 
just third, fourth generation workers. And of course you have the wealthy that are the business owners. And, and later industrialization, especially this group though, is going to change a lot of cultural components with the cult of domesticity, um, shopping, advertisements, things like that. And I do have a look at the cult of domesticity. Um, I'll kind of post up a, a thing for that later. Um, so that's the shift. That's the low mills. You have early factory and then ultimately shift to immigration and everything else.